Hello, everybody, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. I am this program's co-host. I'm DeSoto Brown from the Bishop Museum. And joining us electronically today are two of our friends, the host of this program, Martin Despang, and then speaking to us from California, Ron Lundgren. And we're going to be talking about a location in California today. But let's get, and you see Ron and uh, Martin on screen with me right now in still photos. And Martin, let's get started with you talking about our first slides. Yeah, let's get that up. And, you know, sometimes you and I just totally need to get off our rock to understand it better. And thanks to you, Ron, you take us on an early spring break to the other side of, to that, your other side of the Pacific Ocean, to your Long Beach. And as this slide here might sort of indicate a little irritatingly is while, you know, um, we don't actually don't have, you see at the top left, you see this interview that Harvey Keller did with your friend and business partner, Ron, uh, Edward Killingsworth, and it's still up online, so I encourage you guys to, to watch it. While obviously, you know, Ed is proud of everything you guys have done and many of the projects you've been spearheading, uh, Ron, but he always goes back to actually for the reason, because that book about the case study houses was published by the German publisher, Benedict Tushin, that you know, DeSoto. Yes, yes, I have met and, Benedict. Uh, so, so, so it's obviously comprised of the beginning of the firm, the single family residential work that um, at the bottom right also was featured in a very professional movie about the photographer that was, you know, uh, showcasing and photographing all your work, Ron, that was Julius Schulman. And uh, he chose for his movie cover, the uh, case study house number 22, the Stahlhaus by Pierre Koenig, that small world, my sister had the chance to visit when Joel Silver, the Hollywood producer, was owning it, and he previously lived in an Airstream trailer, which is the next movie that Eric Bricker, who's the movie maker's name, made, and it's going to be uh, out soon. It's going to be called Illumination. And then he must have been thinking, well, there was the case day house number 25, which we see up there, which is the Frank house, which is by Ed. So now he's making a third movie, and they're very professional. You're very excited about the first one was actually narrated by Dustin Hoffman. So this has sort of Hollywood standards run, right? And you and Eric have been talking quite a bit. And you've been educating each other that most of the architects have stayed in California and their region. So as, for example, Pierre Koenig, but two of them had made it out there in the world. And the one was Ed. And the other one, if we go to the next slide here, is another guy, and you and I just sort of have been stumbling upon the typology we're talking about today, which is higher education every now and then. Right. On the top right is very famous Paul Rudolph's um, Yale School of Architecture. But probably what comes to your mind, the most and first and foremost, is Cranbrook Academy on the top left by a father and son, Eliel and Aero Seren. And we've been now putting together all of our memories and thoughts about campuses in the United States. And the bottom row of pictures is very familiar to you, Ron, because you're a graduate and alum from that uh, college, which is MIT. And they have below the Brutalist, um, Rudolph is an IMP of Brutalist, which we have one on campus. The initiation of the campus is actually that boomerang looking building by another European immigrant, Alba Otto. Two other projects is Kresge Auditorium and MIT Chapel, both which you, Ron, have witnessed when you were the student there. And let's go on to the next slide. Although Saren had made it on the cover of the Time magazine, but we were talking to him on the show that he, his attitude was not, I'm a star architect. You know, he was a very, very down to earth guy, high modern master, just like Ed. Uh, left to him is Drake University, a dorm which I've witnessed myself. And at the bottom, I took pictures of myself from a women's dorm at the University of Pennsylvania, a very fascinating project. And that one actually has been remodeled recently to its original standards. Um, and go to the next slide, I throw in a little nationalism here. I mean, Fungaroa at the bottom left is my Perry days, where I happened to be there with these emerging generations for a field trip when it was the day before they closed Crown Hall, the architecture school building designed by me for renovation by Crook and Sexton. And the bottom right is the day when I moved on to the desert and with my desert red pack students and we visited when it was just completed. So again, um, IIT, another campus, you know, very, very kind of signature style associated with 
an Arctic dream. And one more example, next slide, is getting closer to your region, Ron. This is the uh, UC Irvine, with William Pereira having been the master planner. And he's mostly known for when uh, you and I talk, so, so we talk about flying in and out and, and, and aviation and the LAX steam building at the very top right. Mostly known he's for the um, Pan American uh, high rise in San Francisco. And next to that is, gets us more to the typology we're talking about, is the Geisel Library in San Diego on the campus. And unfortunately, I was just reading before the show, um, his master plan has pretty much not only ignored, but also in large part been undone, which is very unfortunate. Not so much the one you will talk about, uh, Ron, today, which is not that known. So we're going to make up for that. So it's your stage now. Please introduce us where you're taking us. Yes, uh, the next slide is of uh, a sort of dreamlike traditional quad, uh, a, a modest space, but very uh, recognizably uh, a, a place for university learning. You know, in the previous programs that highlighted Ed Killingsworth's contributions to uh, modern Hawaiian architecture, I hope that we've all three demonstrated his real affection for the islands. Uh, they became a second home, and that's certainly where much of his best work exists. He loved working and living in Honolulu. He also loved spending a tremendous amount of time of his career in carefully guiding the growth of what became California State University Long Beach. Way back in 1962, the trustees of the 23 state colleges had appointed him as the master plan architect for a 323-acre site. And what most people don't know is that he held that tenure, he held that position for nearly 40 years, which was a uh, record in uh, American education history. His primary goal for the campus, as you can see in this slide, I think, was to create a memorable visual image for the school. And there were some halcyon growth years that he oversaw because his student population grew from 10,000 to 38,000. Now, there was a very admirable, sustained clarity of vision for this campus in which an original mid-century modern style of architecture was maintained and is still being maintained over decades. In Long Beach, that style was never considered passe or outdated. And frankly, such an attitude has resulted in a modest, handsome, architecturally unified and beautifully landscaped campus that I believe remains a wonderfully humane setting for a university education. We're going to look now at some photos that I happily took uh, in the recent past. And while we look at uh, examples of how unified it is and how beautifully landscaped and other, other considerations about uh, the campus's success as, uh, as a visual work of art, I'll mention some principles that might even be considered a recipe for successful campus planning, maybe anywhere over the long term. We're maybe talking how we're at you age. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, we're starting with that very traditional, memorable quad with beautiful, mature trees. If we go to the next slide, uh, one of the principles that uh, Ed Killingsworth had was that. He, as campus master planner, needed a sidekick, but a, 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 an equal sidekick. He talked the university president into establishing a position called the University Campus uh, Landscape Master Planner, who also had great authority in making decisions about what the campus would look like. This uh, composite of photos shows a very interesting a feature that that architect at Lovell, with that support, uh, created on campus. It's a, it's a small Japanese island, uh, a small Japanese garden, designed strictly to be a quiet refuge and a place maybe to unwind during exam week, not only for students but for uh, uh, Harriet faculty. And if you go to we want yes. to mention that at the very top left, this is actually a model 
And that was done by your business partner, Larry Stricker, that we're going to do two shows about his Mauna Lani and the Ilani later. And tell us about the, the size of that model and the size of Larry's hand. <laughs> when you meet Larry Stricker, he's, a, he's about a six foot three Norse Viking with the, with the beard and, and, you know, the whole fierce look. Enormous hands, or I should say paws. But he could build models like an angel. In the upper left-hand corner, you're seeing a tiny little aerial view of a university uh, uh, model of, of the entire university. And here it was the Japanese garden itself. And that Japanese garden is about, in reality, about two inches long. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, and Ron, and this has been the entire model at the end. And, and Ron, this has been continuously updated and preserved and uh, maintained, correct? Yes, and it's such a great campus tool to use for, for example, uh, parents of students who are going to be going to that school, uh, who can get an overview of what the campus really is is all about before they then go out and explore it with their boy or girl who was going to attend school there, uh, and also showing 40 years of development of the campus. And as I was saying in the next slide, uh, talking about landscaping, one of the uh, uh, precepts that Ed Killingsworth always had was that, frankly, if the architecture could basically be hidden behind the landscaping, that was his preference. And here's a case where there's a very dense world of trees, mature trees, that are concealing one of the first buildings ever uh, put up on campus, a building by Ed Killingsworth, which was originally uh, a uh, mid-rise administration building. And I also recall, Ron, that you said there was, as in many cases, there was no really budget and money so Ed basically had this sort of fundraising money for trees, and we have this very special peach tree background today, which you saw at the very beginning. And then I think lack of money also gets us to the next page because there was this artist program, which if I recall correctly, what you told me, the material was donated, but then the artists donated their creativity, right? Let's go to the next page. You know, this, uh, Ed helped to organize what was the first International Sculpture uh, University Sculpture Symposium in the United States, and what he and all of the university officials were thinking was that they wanted to bring large-scale public art to the students and the faculty, um, and they didn't have the money to do it, and so uh, the ploy was to invite uh, very well-known sculptors from all over the world uh, to. Uh, design uh, sculptures and work with local uh, Los Angeles manufacturers who would create them. The manufacturers provided the uh, materials and in some cases, some incredible technical advances just to have them built. Uh, and the artist, they managed to get uh, several free weeks in beautiful California for free but they donated their time and their designs. The end result. The end result. Yeah, let's go to the next slide, which you have. That was my favorite. That's why I choose it by Claire Falkenstein, this very sort of Harry Bertoya esque is to refer to a colleague of hers, you know, maze thing in that in that water pond in that reflecting pool next to the uh, Edmund building that right. Yes, and uh, uh, Claire Falkenstein is, is a real hero in, in all of Long Beach in that there's a lot of her public art uh, throughout the city. Uh, but this was the largest piece in Long Beach. And again, she donated the time and the design. And as a present, there are 23 such very large scale public artworks scattered around the campus uh, to be enjoyed by public and students and faculty. Very clever. Okay. In the next, in, in the next slide, we're seeing uh, a, a kind of uh, visual representation that the campus was developed over 40 years uh, in what was originally a mid-century modern uh, style. And uh, here you see these very light 
porticos sliding in and out amongst uh, larger buildings to create uh, pathways from building to building in a very mid-century modern way. Uh, it doesn't look passe to me, and uh, uh, it is that sort of design mentality is still being uh, followed today. It mm -hmm. looks beautiful too. Yeah, and let's check out the, the, the sort of the instigating um, uh, Edmund building by add a little closer on the next two slides because that one is mm, my yes. favorite. Yes, right. Yeah, it, this was Ed Kenneth's very first uh, building on campus. It was meant to be uh, the first thing one saw when one drove into the formal entry to the, the campus. Not so much for students, but for the, the, the visitors uh, and the parents of the students. It was uh, a multi-story admin building, uh, modest, crisp, as you can see in the detailing, with uh, his signature uh, beam extensions, which in this case supported an entire wall of louvers that protected the offices within from east and west sun. And in the next slide, you can see uh, Larry Stricker's model uh, on the left, and this very crisp, in what I think is a very handsome, uh, nine-story uh, admin building. Absolutely. Uh, and doesn't us remind that the total about Kuykendall Hall? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We probably have to talk about, again, because there's some sad news that we got to yep. share further down the three episodes of this and, series here. And Ron, those louvers on the exterior do not move. They are fixed, correct, in that exterior yes, that, wall? Yes, that, that, that is correct. They're held away from, in fact, they're held away from the, uh, the glazing uh, of the offices nearly five feet out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I might say also about uh, that the photographs that shows the crisp uh, building is that you see a sort of handsome looking uh, material at the end. Uh, and it was, a, a, it was called a peach ruffle brick and it had a gray mortar. One of Ed's uh, stipulations, if, if he was going to be master planner, was that all throughout the campus, there would only be a limited and modest materials palette. And, mm -hmm. and so every building on campus has to have walls or some walls utilizing this brick as a way to have a unified and a congenial architectural ensemble. And good for him. And I, and I, think it's it's remarkable that it lasted as long as his, as it did. I've never been to this campus, but I'm very anxious to see it someday, having now visited it just visually through you and telling us more about it. And I'm anxious to uh, give you that guided tour. Okay, let's continue. Let's oh, go to the next awesome. slide. Yeah. On the next, slide, the next slide that he designed and talking peachy, this is a very peachy shot. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if this is... If someone took this shot at a one of those, you know, peachy sunsets, it sometimes would occur. But yeah. uh, either that, or it's Ed, a brush actually, fire in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Ed, Ed actually completed six buildings on the campus because he wanted to set some standards for design ex excellence. And the second busiest building on campus was the campus bookstore, which you see here, a very simple uh, pavilion. Uh, raised up on Pilates with a nice outdoor space beneath it. Uh, and again, with four walls of louvers, in this case, uh, facing due east. And in the next slide, uh, the peaciness goes away, and we see kind of a, a mid-century black and white photograph showing the, that sort of mid-century ambience of courtyards and spaces that were developed all around the, uh, the campus bookstore. Mm, and shading trellises, which gets yes, us indeed. to the next slide. Yeah, especially in the next, in the next slide, another unifying uh, uh, design strategy, especially in the buildings that uh, Ed designed, was that whatever, if it was housing or if it might have been uh, a, an office or uh, classrooms, these low-rise buildings were all, well, the, the proper word probably is they were all festooned with these uh, trellis structures, very light uh, steel columns supporting shade uh, elements overhead, uh, creating a very human scale, and again, being found all throughout the campus. 
All right. And how that progressed over time, hearing more even first-hand experience, let's go to your beach to the next slide. You know, th this, this slide is one that really makes me happy. Someone came up with the idea of putting these giant letters, Go Beach, which is the athletic cry of all of the, all of the nearly uh, uh, 38,000 students who go here. Uh, what this is showing, uh, you're seeing a bit of a building, again, with that uh, Killingsworth uh, columns that are, are very handsomely designed with uh, re-entrant corners and extended, extended beams. But this is something that I designed 26 years after Ed Killingsworth designed the original union. And I wasn't about to invent the wheel, and we were going to maintain that mid-century modern look Believing that even today, the freshness about it, the human scale that it provides, is uh, a worthwhile endeavor to uh, attempt to maintain. And bravo yeah, that you did timeless. it. Timeless, right? Yes, yeah, timeless, and bravo that you that you carried on Ed's work, mm -hmm. and obviously you being a disciple of his, so to speak, you were capable of doing so. And I'm very grateful that you did, and thank you. In the ne next slide, in the upper left-hand corner, is just, again, a, a portion of uh, uh, Larry's model, always updated every year, which showed the student union, uh, which is actually a, a, a sort of uh, collection of pavilions. But I, I needed to make a sort of uh, marker at one of the most busy intersections where buses and cars come together uh, to let students off. And so I, I created uh, this little glazed pavilion. Uh, no one can not know what it is. As you can see, it says University Student Union. And then it led to a bridge that spanned across uh, ground falling away that eventually connected to the original, uh, the original union. And uh, in the next slide, you just see, see some details of that, uh, the inside of that glazed pavilion and that campus marker for the student union. Uh, in, the bottom, in, the, in the bottom of the left-hand picture, you see some kind of handsome-looking stone materials. This was one of, the, one of the design strategies I had that failed, unfortunately. The idea of where you see what look like little posters that are inset into them was that was where telephones were supposed to have been mm. installed. <laughs> and of course, no one uses uh, uh, anything except their cell phones anymore. So that 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 gesture uh, came and went. Mm. I'm not your now, fault. That's, that's right. But you can see my uh, my version of Ed's mid-century modern architecture there. And in the next slide, you see Ed's original uh, design, where there is some monumentality to his uh, soaring uh, columns and beams. On the left is actually just a portion of a two-story interior courtyard, which is used all day long in good weather. Uh, by the uh, many food venues that happen to be located on that floor. And in the next slide, there's Ed's dictum again. Two pictures showing, yes, it's a monumental building and it's a large building, but it is partly concealed and it's certainly humanized by being uh, next to and behind a very handsome alley of mature trees. And, you know, one of the yeah, things that, that really struck me about this picture is that the size and the shape and the color of the tree trunks really complements and goes with the columns and the coloring of the building. So the scale of the trees, the way they've been pruned so that they've got their exposed trunks, same color as the background, it, they go together absolutely marvelously. And I don't know if that was planned. I, I think it was a happy accident that as the trees grew, they were so complementary to the finished building. Actually, because of the very close relationship between the campus master, uh, campus planner, and the landscape planner, 
this kind of what looks like a happy happenstance was actually planned from the start. Yeah. It, it's just that it took decades of growth. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that when the campus was rather fresh and raw, that it didn't have this handsome garden no. ambiance. No. And it there's a lot of shade, too. And, and of course, yes. as you said, when this was new, the shade would not have been there. The trees were immature. No, no, I want to add to that because I did, because, you know, on behalf of the three of us, I came in when Jay asked me to, you know, share my thoughts about the very current topic of our president wanting to make architecture classicist again. And you, Ron, at many times pointed out that, that ads and you following our classes, did, but as we can see here, very humanized, very elegant, very sophisticated classes, exactly. which unfortunately can't really expect from our current president, right? No, so, not him and the people who surround him either, but... That is a very painful subject that I don't think we want to go into. This is going to be our last slide for today. Um, we're going to yeah. be continuing this trip through this school campus in our next one or two shows. And uh, Ron, thank you very much for taking us on this trip, explaining it from the standpoint of a person who actually participated. And again, as I said, it makes me want to go visit it and walk around and look at it. And Martin didn't yeah. happen to be here today because of illness, but he should be with us for our next show. But this is incentive enough to get better again and go on this extended spring break yeah. trip to your beach. Yes, Ron, thanks. That's, this right. Is, that's right. This is fun. Okay, so thank you, Ron. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, viewers, for being with us. And we will see you next time we are on Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. Until then, aloha. <laughs>